uh, we'd have, I knew we'd have a few less show up tonight because I changed the time other than what the, the normal time for these are. So with that said, let me get all my buttons going right and we'll go ahead and get started. All right, can y'all see that okay? Here we go. You know, this month this month's topic is backyard birds. I appreciate everyone signing up and everyone showing up tonight. Again, apologize for the time change on it and uh hope everyone's fed supper and and ready to learn a little bit tonight or at least the way I shoot backyard birds. And really tonight's not tonight's presentation is is going to be you know, we can talk photography, but a lot, a lot of it's going to be strategies on how you do backyard birds. Uh, I am a, uh, I'm a longtime photographer, always been a nature photographer. I've told this story before. I don't know if you heard it or not, but I uncovered a paper I wrote as a junior in high school 36 years ago that I wrote about wildlife photography. So this is something I've been interested in for a long time. And, uh, but along those same lines, and this is kind of in the vein of what we'll talk about tonight. One of the things I've really been interested in, I'm an, I'm an, I call myself an amateur wildlife biologist. Uh, I've written books about wildlife biology and managing wildlife. It's not, you know, it can be complicated, and the nuances of wildlife biology can be complicated. But the basics of it on how to attract animals to a certain spot, uh, my ability to understand that has served me really well in being able to photograph. A lot of wildlife and you know up close for a long long time now so tonight i'm going to share with you some some things to think about if you're interested in shooting backyard birds so this will be sort of more of the the uh, strategies on how to do this not necessarily dive deep into the photography stuff but we can certainly talk about that as well and as always uh when we go through this tonight i want this to be a dialogue and not a monologue so if you have any questions as i go along feel free to speak up I'll be glad to answer anything that you have. But uh, again, tonight's topic's backyard birds. My name is Russell Graves. I am coming to you live from Hackberry Farm in Dodge City, Texas. Uh, it's uh, it's pretty muddy outside right now. I just got back last night. I've been for the past, I guess, ten days in the Smoky Mountains, on a, doing a photo workshop, and uh, that was a wonderful time. I always love going to the Smokies. It's one of my favorite places on earth. But uh. But it's still nice to always get to come back home and get to see what we have around here. So one of the things I always ask, and by the way, all these pictures you're going to see tonight were all taken. If they weren't in me, if they weren't in my backyard, they were in somebody's backyard. Because one of the things that uh, I've always had the advantage of is being able to. People invite me to come over if they're if they've got a lot of nice birds in their backyard showing up in their place. And so all these birds tonight were taken with these same techniques I'm going to talk about tonight. So why backyard birds? Oh, got someone else coming in. Hang on. One reason is they're close to home. You know, I talk about this a lot in my workshops. I think it's valuable to always be taking pictures because the one thing, you know, people are always looking for magic bullets on what can I do to get better at photography. And, you know, or what kind of piece of equipment can I buy to make me better? And it really all comes down to, we, you know, you get better at photography like you got better at walking when you're a little kid. And that is you just practice and, and just did it a bunch. And that's the, the best advice I can give. And so one of, the, one of the things I tell people all the time is a lot of times I'll take pictures in less than stellar lighting conditions just for the practice of going through the motions of taking pictures. And thinking about the controls and and thinking about all those things you can think about. So when we talk about backyard birds, if anything, that's a a, a a fantastic reason to focus on taking pictures in your own backyard. And I and I mean and I, again, I use backyard as not maybe your little backyard, but also it could be a park down the road or anywhere else. Uh, I always I'm an advocate of doing that just because it gets you out and it gets you taking more pictures. The more pictures you take, the better you're going to be at it. So backyard birds, anything close to home, uh, is you'll be able to see a lot of a, a lot of really neat stuff if you really pay attention. And they're you know relatively easy to attract. I mean, birds are everywhere. One of the one of the cool things, and this is past the uh, 
Cornell Bird Laboratory, they've got a website that will show you, if you want to be amazed when you're talking about birds, uh, the Cornell uh, Laboratory, or the Cornell, I forgot what they're called, the Ornithological yeah. Laboratory at Cornell University, they've got a yeah. separate website about the bird migration, and they'll give you an estimate any, at any time of the year how many birds are flying over your county at that given time. And when you look, especially in our county, we're not necessarily known as a, we're flyover country here in North Texas. We're not necessarily known as is a birding hotspot, but it's amazing when you look at that number, especially like during May, and there's millions of birds flying overhead head at any given day, day. And so those birds, what we're going to talk about tonight, they need a place to stop and rest and they need a place to refuel, so to speak. And so they become pretty easy to attract. And then, like I said before, just doing all this, it provides an ease of practice that you really can't get anywhere else. And if you have a backyard or if you have a park or a, or someone else's, a friend's backyard, you can do all these strategies there. And so one of the important things to know about wildlife is every wildlife species, including us, if we count ourselves, need five primary things to survive. And this is where it comes into the management of it. And once you understand these things, it becomes easier to attract birds or bugs or big mammals or whatever else you're trying to attract to photograph. If you understand these things, it becomes easier to find them when you're in the field. It also becomes easier to attract. You know, one of the things that, as an aside, I talk to people about a lot when we're doing workshops is they seem to think I've got some sort of innate ability to find wildlife. And I really don't. I joke with people and tell them that's my superhero power. But really, it's understanding these things that helps me find wildlife. You know, it's it's like, Bill, I'm going to pick on you for a minute. If 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 I want to find Bill, all I've got to do is figure out what are Bill's favorite restaurants, what's the neighborhood Bill lives in, uh, you know, what what are kind of his general habits. And if I go hang around Bill's neighborhood long enough, I'm going to see Bill a lot, and I'll be able to photograph him. And so and so we, when we talk about the five things wildlife needs to to thrive. That applies not only to backyard birds, but also applies to when you're going to a national park. If you kind of know, like if you go to Yellowstone and you're looking for bears and you understand what a typical, like a black bear habitat is and find out where their food sources are and where their water sources are and all that, the things we'll talk about, it gets easier to find bears. And so the five things that wildlife needs in order to thrive is food, same as us. They need water, cover, which is cover is place to hide, place to get out of the weather. They need space, and that's different for different uh, different uh, species. So in other words, if you're talking backyard birds, it's probably unlikely that you'll attract many bald eagles to your backyard because they need they have a lot more space and they have a lot more distinct food requirements than, say, a, a cardinal has. And so when we're talking about space, it's again, it's different for every species of wildlife, whether deer, or moose, or bison, or or sparrows, or uh, or hummingbirds, and so food, water, cover, space, and then the last thing, and this is a little more nebulous, is and that's arrangement. Now we'll get deeper into all these and how they apply, but arrangement is there is the arrangement of all four of those things in in relation to one another, and how wildlife utilizes all four of those food, water, cover, and space. How they're able to utilize them to live their life most efficiently. It's it's really as simple as this. If uh, if all of a sudden you lived in a neighborhood where there was no easy access to food, like the grocery stores all closed down and the restaurants all closed down, you could still have water and a place to live, cover, and you know you've got your your yard, plenty of space to move around. But without one of these key components like food, all of a sudden it doesn't make your neighborhood very tenable. You have to end up going somewhere else. Same way with water, same way with all these. So all, all, all these habitat requirements all fit into, in, they all fit together and help any species of wildlife thrive. And so let's talk about food for just a minute. By the way, a lot of these setups like this are not here, uh, are artificial setups. I, you know, a lot of times I'll set up limbs and stuff or small brush piles. I used to do this all the time. I still do it some, but I'm I'm uh, I'm in the process of setting up some other areas that aren't necessarily in my backyard, but they're elsewhere on the farm. But I'd set up brush small brush piles or sticks and give animals a place to land on, and so I'd have a nice background in order to photograph them. 
But in a, on the subject of food, you know, like I say here, you can provide food like bird seed or hummingbird feeders. One of my favorite things to do, especially this time of year, is to feed the hummingbirds. And a simple concoction, you can buy commercial hummingbird uh, food, I, you know, like at our local tractor supply. They sell like a red nectar that you can put in the feeders. And I have found that at least my hummingbirds with their with their local palate don't like that stuff as much as a simple sugar and water solution. And so I'll mix four parts sugar with one, I mean, four, four parts water with one part sugar. And uh, it's a little bit sweet, but those hummingbirds seem to be really attracted to that. And then bird seed that you can buy from any, any farm store or any department store. Uh, I keep feeders filled up around here and that does a good job not only in the summer or in the winter time attracting them, but in the case of hummingbirds in the summer. But one of the things I'll say about food is when the birds, the birds will, especially the local birds that don't migrate, like the cardinals, they'll become a little bit reliant on it. So I don't feed seasonally. I try to at least have food available for them all year round. Hopefully it'll get them through the winter, but as natural food sources come back and I try to manage my property and I know I'm different where I live on acreage where a lot of people don't, but you can still, and I'll share some strategies with you in a minute. You can still uh, have some plants and stuff that provide seasonal food all year round for the different birds you have on your place. And like I said here, you can do garden plantings that, that attract wildlife. When I built my house here, one of the things I wanted to do, and it's 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 a pollinator garden on steroids. I mean, it's probably about a half acre in size, but I planted a big uh, a big place out in front of our house. We have a big circle drive, and in the middle of the circle, I've got a lot of just native wildflowers that grow out there. And you don't have to do it that big. You can do the corner of your yard in pollinator plants and po pollinator plants because that'll not only attract uh, insects. Oh, got someone come else coming in. That'll not only attract insects and uh, and other bugs, which other bugs will, will provide more food for those birds that like to eat bugs for food, but also attract things like hummingbirds. So uh, garden plantings around your yard do a lot to provide food. And it's just, it. I'm, I have to be really vague on this because different, I don't know where everyone lives. So different plants have different uh, uh they, they do better in, in various locales. So it's always best. And I'll show you some places you can look in a minute, uh, some resources you can look at the end of this presentation to help you try to figure out if this is something you're interested, you're interested in doing. It'll help you figure out uh, what garden plantings that may attract wildlife in your, in your particular locale. Just a few more pictures. You can see here like the, like the scissor tailed flycatcher on the fence, uh, you know, just about every rural area has fences, but this is, we would we would purposefully keep our fences a little bit weedy, our fence lines a little weedy. That way it attracts bugs and those flycatchers eat bugs. And so they'd always be attracted to those the fences right around our house. And uh, we're able to shoot pictures like that. Picture on the left, that that that's a, a ring neck dove, which is an, it's a, it's not a native species of dove in Texas. And I think these things have, have really proliferated all over the country. But uh, that guy was coming into a, a where some bird seed had spilled uh, right in my own backyard by underneath the bird feeder. And then, of course, this little uh, bird on the upper right, that stick, it was an artificial stick I put in place just to give them, give them a perch before they flew over to the feeder. And uh, that's always a good strategy as well. And so all these setups I'm showing you are pretty simple setups. I've even done this in the past if, to provide a, and I think I've got pictures in, the, in here, to provide a, a, a barbed wire fence for just kind of a different sort of rustic look. I have actually put a couple in my backyard, put a couple of posts in the ground, found just some old cedar posts that have a have a good look to them and be a good bird perch, and then, and then go out to a, a farmer or rancher and get just a piece of wire that's six or eight feet long and stretch that wire between two posts that I've sunk in the ground in my backyard to give the birds a place to perch on and, and shoot, be able to shoot a picture, not this particular picture, picture, but a, a sim similar picture. And then the second thing is water. Uh, you know, everything has to have water to survive. And one of the things I've always tried to do is provide water on demand for the birds. 
And the way you can do it is bird bath, bird waters, or even backyard ponds. Where I used to live in the Texas Panhandle, I was talking to my parents about this tonight because I'm in the process of trying to uh, finalize the uh, the lease of a ranch that I will be uh, really doing a lot of intensive management on as a making it a, a wildlife photography destination. And I was telling my parents tonight, just a couple hours ago when I was down the road visiting with them, when I used to live in Childress, Texas, up in the Texas Panhandle, it's a semi-arid part of the state. And I'd watch it rain. And when it would rain, the, the rain would go down my roof, hit the gutters, and then just spill out onto the yard. And so I felt like all that rain was going away. So on a whim one day, I created a small backyard pond and bought a pond liner like you can buy at any landscaping store or Lowe's Home Improvement and went and collected some local rocks around and 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 built this pond and every and then and then dug a ditch and put some pipe underground so every time it rained water would run off the roof through the gutters down the downspouts into a pipe underground and spill out into this pond and it was what kept that pond full and the pond would often overflow because the crazy thing about water if you're able to uh and, and this varies by state in texas we can capture water like that but it for every thousand square feet of roof space, it, it'll collect well, one inch of rain will produce 625 gallons of water. And so every inch of rain we got 625 gallons would run off into this pond. Well, the pond wasn't deep, you know, it was maybe a foot deep at the deepest. And then I collected those rocks and kind of dressed it up. <laughs> and then lo and behold, uh, because it was a semi-arid part of the state and water was what was in lim the limiting supply there. Once you added water, all the birds in the neighborhoods or in the area started coming there to drink. And in fact, this mockingbird picture you're looking at there, that was in my backyard pond. And that cost me maybe a hundred dollars to build. It took me a couple of weekends to kind of do it, but for the most part, it cost me a hundred dollars to build. Didn't take a whole lot of water to keep it filled up. If I wanted to, I didn't, you know, I went through the trouble of, capturing water off my gutters but if you wanted to you could even run a water hose out to that thing and keep it full of water and uh but just just because i added water to the mix it made an attraction there and then if i put food nearby then i had a steady parade of birds showing up at my house all day long every day and it wasn't a big deal to uh to be able to uh to photograph birds around the water holes and then one of the things I try to do too is keep fresh water out for them all the time. This is the same pond. Here's a turkey drinking out of the water out of the pond. I I had the ability to uh, get almost at eye level with the water the way I built everything behind my house. And so when turkeys would come in, uh, they'd drink. And I mean, this is uncropped. I'd be that close to them and be able to get shots like that of them drinking. And again, turkeys. You know, you know if you live in an urban area somewhere I don't or a suburban area somewhere you know turkeys may be a one one step beyond what you're able to accomplish but the little birds uh are are easy to attract like that and then the third thing we talked about in the five things that wildlife needs is cover and right now these painted buntings are my nemesis here on my farm because I can drive around and see them all the time but I haven't cracked the code on how to attract them to one spot because where I live now Water is not a limiting factor in the habitat. In fact, there's water everywhere on my farm alone. I have a creek that runs through it that runs most of the year. I have a pond I dug that's our recreational pond. We, we've we got it stocked with fish, and, and uh, I've swam in it a few times, and we use it for things like that. And then I've got uh, two wetlands on my property. And so water is not a limiting factor. So I can't attract anything with water because water is here all the time. It does attract birds. Like I walked out right before we started this and right beside my house, there was a, uh, a, a great egret that was feeding on one of my wetlands I could see and they're around, but these, these guys right now are my nemesis. I can't figure out how to track them to one spot to be able to photograph them. And so this picture here you're looking at was actually taken around that pond I just mentioned that I built behind my house when I lived in the panhandle. And one of the things I would do too I'd mentioned earlier is provide artificial brush piles for them or do plantings that would provide cover. So that way the little birds, once they showed up to drink water, they felt like they had a place they could hide in while they make sure that, that uh, 
the coast was clear. Then they'd go down and drink for a little bit. Then they'd fly back up to cover to just to rest some. some. And so, uh, I, like I said, birds need cover for nesting, roosting, and loafing. And loafing is just what it sounds like. It's loafing. They, you know, the, like us, they need rest too. And so when they're not sleeping or, or sitting on eggs trying to hatch babies, they'll often spend a lot of part of their day loafing out of the sun or just loafing to, to rest or whatever. And so you, I hope you can start seeing how all these things tie together, the food, the water, the cover, and uh, how they all benefit birds. And again, I keep, I know I keep telling you stories about how I do this on a larger scale on a, on my property, but all of these strategies are things that you can use in, in your own backyard because I've done it before. When I first got married and for the first maybe 10 years I was married, I mean, we lived in a small town, but we lived in town on the edge of town. And so we were, we had a typical, you know, privacy fence backyard. Our, our house was on a lot and a half. Uh, in town we had a bigger yard but it was still at the, at the edge of town with houses on both sides of us and houses across the street so it was a typical suburban kind of neighborhood even though it was in a small town but I used to practice all these same things in my own backyard and then uh, you know I mentioned this already and by adding cover it helps the little birds access uh, the food and water or that you're going to set out for, for to try to attract them and really the key thing is when a bird like a painted bunting is is literally four inches tall or six inches tall and they're that small and they have no fighting skills and they understand their place in the food web that everything's out to kill them this is where cover really becomes valuable to the small birds because the big birds like if you happen to attract owls or something they don't you know they're not worried about it but the little birds are pretty paranoid about being being uh, preyed upon by bigger animals and so the cover becomes real important to them And I mentioned this already, what your purchase can be made of. Trees, old fence posts, rocks, or any other natural material. And I've set out everything and uh, and just waited around for them and waited them to show up. By the way, this roadrunner here was on my water, at my water hole. That's, that's one of the natural perches I just talked about. I put out rocks and then birds always seem to like to get the, sit on the high ground. So any kind of rock that was a little bit higher than the rest of them, they would sit up on while they're, while they're, hanging out and resting and waiting to go get another drink and then space to find is the amount of physical space each species uh requires to thrive and that's different for different birds and again i'm i'm saying that kind of vague because the birds i would typically have here in northeast texas are different than the birds i would have seen in northwest texas where i used to live and where i'm trying to to acquire the the ranch i previously spoke of and they're going to be different than they are somewhere on the East Coast or out in Colorado or wherever. So each bird, the each locale has different species of birds and each bird has different space requirements as well as food, water and cover requirements. So it's really a matter of trying to figure out what you have there and then learning all you can. That's one of the big tips I teach about any kind of wildlife photography. The more you can learn about the species, the more successful you'll always be at photographing that species. And so once you learn about the birds you have and what they like to eat and, and and their habitat requirements and the kind of cover requirements they have, then it's easy to figure out the space and can you can you attract that kind of bird to your uh, to your location. And then you can't do much. You may be thinking, you know, if it's a migratory bird, well, you can't do much about space there. But for the small songbirds that always seem to be around, you can do a little bit there about about mitigating the amount of space you have as it applies to uh, what they require. And then again, just a few more bird shots on some uh, artificial perches. The Cardinal, I'd mentioned earlier about putting two fence posts in the ground and this was at my old house. Uh, when I lived in town, I put two fence posts in the ground in the backyard and I could actually shoot out my back window. I had it set up with a, where if I raised the window up, I could, I could put a piece of black cloth in the window and then just stick my lens out. And when I'd look out through the blinds and see birds on the perch, I'd take pictures of them from my house. And so that's one of the posts that I just dug a hole in the ground and planted that post in the ground and, and just kept bird feet out around it. And birds would always come in and, and perch on that post. That was uh, 
for them maybe not t- cover where they're going to hide, but it was it was loafing cover. It's something that they could they could perch on. It was up high, and they could keep a better eye on predators around them. And they would just frequently sit there for 10, 15, 30 seconds before they moved on somewhere else, but you're able to get some good shots. And by making perches and planning where you're going to feed the birds, uh, you can accomplish these really soft, out-of-focus backgrounds like like you see in a lot of these shots I'm taking. And then I used to, I haven't done it much in a while because I kind of reached my limit because I got them, but I used to always be on the lookout for stumps that look good that I could just, that I didn't have to dig in the ground, but I could move them around because a lot of times I might put a stump in one place one day and then move it somewhere else on another day. And so I'd always look for stumps that would kind of stand up on their own and be able to get shots of like that, uh, that Robin there. And then, and then the picture of the little sparrow on the lower right, that was uh, on the rocks around my little pond that I built behind my house. And then arrangement refers to, like we mentioned earlier, the, the relation of food, water, and cover to one another. Uh, you know, space, again, is kind of nebulous. You, you can do a little bit about space, but not much about it. But the arrangement on how everything kind of connects to one another is important. For a little bird, let's say you've got a typical size backyard. If you had food in one cover, water in another cover, and, and or water in another corner, and then brush in another corner, they're likely not going to use any three of them at one time. They may go to the food and fly somewhere else, or they may go to the water and fly somewhere else. But what I try to do is put the arrangement based on the species or based on the group of species. Like if I'm just trying to track small songbirds that are seed eaters, then I, I keep that in mind. Like right now, I mean, it's, it's a, uh, this is the wall you see behind me, that window right there. If I open that window, that looks out to my backyard. And just if the wall wasn't here, you could see behind me, maybe 10 yards back, I've got a feet, I've got a bird feeder out that sits right against some trees. And so that gives the bird, I'm using just the natural cover I have to uh to benefit the birds. And then I can mm-hmm. put my own perches back there. So when the birds come in to uh eat seed, then they can they can perch on the on the perches I have that are good for photography, but then they can retreat to the safety of the of the canopy of the trees if they need to. So that's where I'm using, instead of making cover, I'm using the cover I have available and just improving the arrangement for the for the animals that are going to utilize all that. Does that make sense? And then each species, of course, has its own requirement because everything fills its own niche, but there is a considerable amount of overlap on, you know, a, a cardinal and a... a a cardinal and a wren or a cardinal and a phoebe are going to have similar, maybe not, the, they're not going to eat the same thing, but they've got similar habitat requirements where that's when I can have some overlap. So I'm usually not doing these setups just for one bird, but I'm usually trying to do a general setup that'll attract as many birds as I can. And like I keep saying, you can provide all that in your own backyard if you want to. And it's not really that hard to do. It just takes a little research, takes a little work. But if you love birds, uh, it's it's always worth it. I mean, I just I get a kick every day uh, out of looking outside and seeing what birds are there. And really, it's a challenge for me to try to unlock how to how to take pictures without really having to work too hard at it. And I know that sounds lazy, but uh, you know, I get the benefit of being able to travel quite a bit, but even when I'm not traveling and even when I'm not working, my hobby is photography. And so I, I'm always trying to, it's a challenge for me to unlock ways to really, to be able to take pictures again and not really have to work that hard at it and use what I've got around me. And that's forever. That was my hustle as a, as a professional photographer, because when I, the first, oh, I had, I was 19 years old when I had my first pictures published in the magazine. I was 20 when I had my first cover. I know it was itching. I was 20 when I had my first cover. And, you know, but I was a young married man. I got married at 23. Uh, I was a school teacher. And so my time was limited and my options were limited. I didn't get to travel nearly as much as what I do now. And so really 
for the first 16 years is I, I was a teacher for 16 years. And so during that 16 years, you know, I didn't have the luxury of going wherever I wanted to go. I didn't get summers off. So I didn't have all summer to travel. I had to work, I had to work during the summer. And so I really just tried to start figuring out strategies to accomplish what I, what I wanted to accomplish. Just really kind of right in my own backyard, so to speak. And again, that backyard means my literal backyard as well as kind of my general surroundings. And, and so, and I still do that today. I love trying to figure out and unlock how to get close to wildlife. I was having this conversation with some, with a, with a, someone the other day on this workshop and they were, they were saying that, you know, because they're starting to shoot more wildlife when they shot landscape, they barely ever cropped an image, but now that they're shooting more wildlife, they crop a lot and they, and they crop pretty extremely most of the time. And my, my question to them, them was, and it's not challenging because, you know, look, I tell people all the time that, doing photography is like putting in a destination on Google maps. It's going to give you, you know, if you do that on Google maps, it's going to give you multiple choices to get to the same destination. And that's how photography is. And so I'm not, you know, I'd never say my way is the right way or the Supreme way. My way is just my way. And so what I, what I asked them about is why are you cropping so much? Because my early on, when I started taking pictures, I shot film. And so film you didn't really have the option of cropping. I mean, if you wanted to, if you wanted to be closer to an animal, you had to use a telephoto lens, number one, and then number two, just figure out how you get closer to animals. And so even today, I like the challenge of trying to figure out how to get closer to animals because not just me, but all of us paid a lot of money for these high dollar sensors that are put inside these cameras. And so I try not to make my default go to is just automatically crop the image so uh <clears throat> i just absolutely love trying to figure out how to get closer to animals and so by using these tips i've been telling you i think the real practical ways and that you can put these things into practice and and help you get closer to animals as well and and, and in fact sometimes like the picture of the morning wc right there uh i got too good at what i was doing because i the that picture's cropped a little bit for this presentation but the if you saw the whole four thirds format picture, I'm too close to him because his end of his tail is cut off. He was, he was, I was too successful at my own game, and so sometimes it works against me trying to be really close. But it's always kind of cool when you're sitting in the blind and you've got a bird nearby, and uh, and you can look those things in the eye and see the catch light in their eyes without having to use your camera. And so a few photo tips on doing <laughs> what we're on attracting backyard birds is. I always think about my perches and arrange them to take advantage of the early morning or late evening light, light depending on what I'm trying to shoot pictures of. Uh, I think that's important. That helps you as you go through exercises like that and thinking through the process and being purposeful in how your setups are. I just think it makes you a better photographer when you're in the field shooting pictures of, of animals that you just happen across at a national or state park or wherever. I just think it helps you out when you're always thinking about the elements it takes to make a better picture. And it's all part of that practice with <clears throat> mental practice in the middle game. We're actually pushing the button on the camera. Uh, if you look at a lot of the back up. of these, these are all kind of bland backgrounds and, and they're all sort of a, from a semi-arid area where I used to live, but more and more I've been, I've been bringing in potted plants to add color to otherwise bland backgrounds. Like this background here, it's complementary to the bird and I don't think it looks bad but it'd be kind of cool too if we had a little green or yellow in that shot as well. Does someone have a question? I think someone. I've yeah, I was going to ask you, you put up net, nest boxes, little bird houses for them uh, for nesting? You know, I'm starting to, uh, that's kind of my summer project this year. I'm past the nesting season, but I just, I had a friend give me some uh, bluebird boxes. I'll, I'll be deploying later this year. And when I get back from my trip to, to uh, Botswana, I, I'm I'm building some barn owl boxes that I'll be deploying on the property to try to attract barn owls and give them a place to stay and 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 roost and uh and and raise their young. And uh one of the things I really try to do is if try to manage I've got a little bit of timber on my place and I try to manage it, especially the uh the one the trees that that maybe only the top breaks out. I'm not anxious to go remove dead trees i leave them in place because they're a good place for good stuff for cavity nesters so i try to 
I'm, I'm starting more and more to put out nest boxes, but I'm also trying to manage the natural nesting cover that they've got as well. And that's where it goes back to what I said in, the, in my opening statement that I consider myself an amateur wildlife biologist. I've read about it and I study about it a lot, but I'm not accredited in any way. And I'm not a, I'm not a wildlife biologist by training. I just love wildlife and love animals and try to figure out things I can do to really put my money where my mouth is. And, you know, if, if I'm going to talk about conservation and, 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 you know, consider myself a conservation photographer, I need to be trying to do my part is trying to make at least my little piece of the world a better place for all the wildlife that lives here. And then, like I said, grow flowers or bring in potted plants to add uh, colors to bland backgrounds. One thing that, that I did this year on a setup I've got for, I'm trying for woodpeckers. Uh, I actually stuck a, 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 a piece of a dead tree in the ground and drilled a couple of holes in the side. And I've been putting suet in it, trying to attract woodpeckers to this dead log. And uh, I've got it on the background it. I've got some big sunflowers growing. And, you know, you can go buy a pack of sunflower seeds for a couple of dollars at just about any any store in the spring. And they're so easy to grow. Or you can, or you can go out and buy a pack of raw sunflower seeds and they'll still grow. And uh, just to give a little bit of color in the background. And then if you decide to feed birds, one thing I recommend is just feed them high quality feed. Because, you know, they're, they're just, they're like us. They're trying to get by and uh, uh, bread or scraps, I don't think usually works for them. Typically, you know, whether it's suet or whether it's a commercial feed, those feeds aren't necessarily blended to be of highest nutritional quality, but they do contain seeds that'll be beneficial to, uh, to the birds in your area based on what kind of birds you're trying to feed and attract. And then the last thing is, if you really get into this, by blind, I don't know what it is about birds, <laughs> but when you sit in a blind or if you build a blind, you seem you disappear to birds. I mean, I've had a, I, I wish I had a video of this, but I remember one time I was taking pictures of the turkeys and there was like 60 of them in this field in front of me and I was sitting in the blind and the wind got up and it blew the blind off of me. So there I am sitting in the chair with the giant telephoto lens in front of me. And 60 sets of turkey eyes are staring back at me like, where did that guy come from? And the only thing I knew to do was I grabbed the blind and pulled it back over me. And when I did, it's like an invisibility cloak. You just disappear to birds. And so if if you, if, if and I've got a video I'm going to try to play. I don't know how well it's going to do. Uh, and and you know, if it's dragging a little bit, tell me and uh, I'll stop it. But I will, since I've got everybody's email, when you register this webinar, uh, when I send out the replay, I'll send a link to the video so you can watch it. But these blinds I'm talking about, and I'll send a link where you can buy them. They're, they're hunting blinds. You go to Bass Pro Shops or Cabela's, uh, either in a store or online and buy them. They're pretty cheap, $50 to buy these things. I know there's a company now that makes blinds for photographers, and those are nice, but just a cheap little blinds, just something you can set in and hide in while you're waiting for the, the birds to show up. Uh may make your neighbors talk about you and wonder what you're doing, but they're super, super effective at getting close to birds because again, the birds just, they can see you get in, but once you get in those things, it's like you're, you're, you're dead to them and you, they disappear, you disappear. And, uh, and it's just amazing. So I'm going to, let me try this right quick. Give me just a second to switch, to try to upload this video. Like I said, if this video is not playing cleanly, since I'm I'm broadcasting from my laptop, just uh, just let me know, and I'll I'll share the link with you. But if it does work, it's is this is a, this is a lot of fun to watch. So can y'all can y'all see a video player up? Is that can y'all see that on your side? That's a yes, Bill. Okay, me sitting in a blind. All right, so this is what those blinds look like from the inside. And again, they've got little windows on each side. They've got a zip-up door in the back. You can see behind me. And then they've got little windows in each side. And all I do is just open up the window and stick my lens through it. But uh, but yeah, this is we'll watch this video. This is, uh, well, I'm not going to spoil it for you, but let me know if this doesn't play smoothly. And then we'll just, we'll figure it out from there. 
just a few minutes into the sit and I've already seen a ton of wildlife by this water hole. I had armadillo come in to get a drink of water. Western meadowlarks, mockingbirds, cardinals, some birds I don't even know what they are have all came in to get a drink of water. I hear a northern flicker outside the blind right now. I'm hoping some quail will come by and even a road runner. I've seen them at this water hole lately. But this water hole, what makes it so attractive to the wildlife is it may be the only one for a few hundred acres around. And so they're all flocking to here to get a drink of water before they go off to bed for the night. But here's the crazy part. I'm right in my own backyard. When you live in a semi-arid climate, water isn't inherently abundant. So when I built my house, I was dismayed at all the water that ran off the roof in a rainstorm. That water just ran off into the pasture and wasn't necessarily providing much of a benefit to the wildlife on the property. You know, for walking literally 50 feet from my back door and setting up on this water hole, this has really been a tough day to beat, or a tough afternoon to beat. I've seen all kinds of little songbirds come in to drink water. Saw an armadillo early on, got some good pictures of him. Uh, I've been seeing a roadrunner come into this water hole and hoping he would come back, but I never saw him come back today. Roadrunners are a little bit skittish. He might have seen this blind and and, and shied away from it but these small birds didn't seem to mind I set up the blind uh, came back about five minutes later with my gear they were all back into the brush and then as soon as I settled in the blind they all flew back in so uh, the sun's getting low lights really great right now uh, I maybe have about 10 or 15 minutes left of good light to photograph before all the birds go to bed so I'm hoping the roadrunner still comes. I'm hoping some bob white quail come and drink out of here because again I saw some earlier today about 10 of them they were all lined up next to each other drinking water and that'll be a really cool shot if I can ever get it but uh, I'll definitely be back here a lot more often you know setting up a place in the backyard is just a real good opportunity whether you live in town or live in the country like I do it's just a real good opportunity to uh, get wildlife in whether you've got a feeder or whether you've got a water source they're gonna come eat they're gonna come drink and uh, it's just giving me a lot of good photographic opportunities today. At my house, I diverted the water from the roof through underground drainage pipes that flow the rainwater from the roof into the pond. The result is a small oasis in an otherwise dry area. As a result, the wildlife flocks to the pond. On any given day, I see deer, turkeys, pigs, coyotes, a host of songbirds, armadillos, and rabbits drinking water from around the edge. The fun part is trying to guess what we'll see next. stop that there uh let me switch all this back over okay yeah you can oops. you can uh but you can see i mean the, that i want to show a video i talked about the pond quite a bit but you saw the pond there it wasn't very big at all it may be the size of size well it wasn't big for my backyard. That was probably the size of a, like a car. Uh, but if I'd have had a smaller pond, it, they would have came with a smaller pond. The key thing was I figured out what the limiting factor of the five things I talked about that wildlife needed. I talk, I figured out what the limiting factor was. And then once I provided that, they all came. And so some practical solutions for you and it, wherever you live is if you can figure out 
what's that one thing that's missing? Most likely it's probably going to be food. If you added food to your backyard and added just a little bird bath or water, and then if there, you had some trees in your backyard, birds are going to show up. Uh, with hummingbirds, if you just add nectar, they're going to show up and be there uh, in all likelihood if they if you've got hummingbirds in your part of the country. But the, the key thing is, is just figuring out what the bird you're trying to track what they need, adding that something, and then just tweaking it from there, just really paying attention. And uh, that's all I've ever done. I'm not, you know, I'm I'm not a super genius when it comes to this stuff. I just do it by trial and error and, and really not afraid to fail. And, and you can't mess up. If you provide good quality food and, and clean water for the animals, you're not going to hurt any animals. Uh, they may not eat it or, the, you know, but it's certainly not going to hurt anything. So it doesn't hurt doesn't hurt anything to try and just do it by trial and error, figure out what works best for your particular locale. And I will note one more thing about that video. That video was made four years ago and I hadn't watched it in a while, but it's astonishing how much grayer my beard is now than it was then. I'm getting old, Bill Webb. You may have any questions. I feel like I've been doing all the hey, talking. Um we we have just a real small yard, but you know we've got food and water and cover and all those things that that you mentioned. And um, I've noticed though this last winter, uh, this past winter, the bird traffic was just it was minimal compared to what it was you know two years ago and three years ago. And I've I've heard some other people say that same thing. Um, are you seeing you know a reduction in the amount of birds that you're seeing at your place? Yeah, so well, two, really, there's two things, and and what you said brought up brought up something in mind. You know, I think it's the Audubon Society that does the backyard bird count, and one of the cool thing about this is you can provide a citizen scientist role of providing valuable data to wildlife biologists that will help them solve vexing problems when it comes to how to manage our our nation's birds. But to your point, Bill, specifically, since I know where you live. I think that bad winter storm we had two years ago is the cause behind all of it. And I just don't think the birds have came back in numbers. I can tell you, and this is all anecdotal. I don't have any hard numbers to back it up. The, and I'd planted a lot of, I mean, I planted with my tractor, a lot of cover and food like, like Milo or maize. I planted, I would go out into my fields and plant two or three acres of a Milo sunflower and corn mix. And, you know, I wasn't doing it to try to harvest a crop. I was just doing it to let it grow up and make the fields look kind of ragged, but provide good cover and food for birds throughout the year. And I know during that winter storm, it was so bad that I don't, I mean, I found dead birds out there. And so the next spring, it was just, it was silent. I mean, around here, you couldn't hear any birds. And I just think it hit them pretty bad. Last year, last spring, it was a little better, and I'm happy to announce this spring. It seems like they're they're. I don't. I don't. I've only lived on this place for. I've owned this place five years. I've only lived here for four years. So what I'm saying is is may not bear out over long term, but I think that uh that uh this year the birds seem around here seem to be back in pretty good numbers because it's I can go out in the morning and hear songbirds everywhere and all the trees around. And so hopefully they're coming back. But I think the first I think the first whammy was just that bad winter storm we had in what was that 2020, 2021? I can't remember what year it was. And and then well and then if we go back even further than that, it's my guess that because because and again, it goes back to what kind of birds you're trying to attract. I mentioned I've got a wetland on my property. It's well, I've got two wetlands on my property. One is small, maybe th half an acre, three quarters of an acre. The other one is about probably four acres in size. It's pretty good size, but we, you know, we haven't had any ducks showing up for the past couple of years. And I think the reason for that is, and that's kind of a long term problem because even though I just moved to this property. This land's been in my family. I'm just the latest one in my family to own it. This land's been in my family for probably the better part of 50 years. And so, and I'm a mile from where I grew up. And so I, I you know, even though when I was living in West Texas, I always came back to right virtually in the same place. So I've kind of got a, 
a, a, a long history of knowing about the wildlife in this area. But with that said, we used to see a lot more ducks than we do. And nationwide, the duck numbers are pretty steady. And I think the reason why is when we had that drought, like back in what, like 2011 to 2013 or 14, uh, I think all the ducks, because the water was drying up in Texas, I think the ducks just went to where the water is. And I think until the area where the ducks went to have a drought, it's going to be a while before we see the duck numbers back in this area like we used to 15 years ago. So I think I think it's just all those nuances in nature set everything back. But hopefully, you know, if we're good stewards, uh, things begin to rebound a little bit. So that's my thought. Any other questions from anybody? Um, on your pond that you built, that the rainwater falls into, uh -huh. uh, what if it doesn't rain? Do you, <laughs> I mean, do you fill it up some other kind of way? Yeah. So, well, I had to, I had two other, my backup options out there were, uh, I had a well that I could fill up with well water, but we didn't drink. Uh -huh. We just had a well because I just had a well dug on my place. Uh, because it, water was pretty shallow there and it was relatively inexpensive to do. And I used that, that well water a lot for just landscape watering. But if I had to, no bigger than it was, I could run water out of my, you know, we were on a county water system out there. So I could just run water from the water hose and keep it filled up. Because it wasn't big, I would bet the total capacity on that thing. I could do the math and figure it out, but I'm just thinking out loud. I bet it wasn't more than... 1,500 gallons of water, and that sounds like a lot, but when you spread it out over a small area, about a foot deep, it doesn't take very long to use up 1,500 gallons. And then, and it would go start going dry sometime. Primarily, I'd use well water to fill it up if it didn't rain. Uh, but even in that case, the worst part of it was water is different wherever you go out there it was a little more because it was a dry climate but water out there probably evaporated about an inch probably an inch or two of water a day and so about once a week i would top it off again out of the well to fill it back up but you could do it out of your again out of your uh out of your the faucet and the water hose but it was there in case it did rain so that was why i had it there Any other questions at all? Well, good. Hey, uh, thanks again for staying with me tonight. Uh, sorry I had to reschedule. I don't know if ever, anybody heard, but I said at the first, I'm going to Botswana Monday. And so I had a I had an appointment at a travel clinic in Dallas. I had to, have to go to Dallas to go to a travel clinic and I had an appointment today and they moved my appointment on me to like 1045. And I just knew there was no way I could get down there for that and then be able to come back. So I appreciate everyone. Uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming every, well, I know everybody got my email from this morning. And so I appreciate everyone joining in tonight and, uh, and listen to what I have to say. And as always, if, uh, if you have any questions about this or anything else, there's, oh, there's the, there's the uh, link I was going to tell you. I don't if you can see that it's, it's National Wildlife Federation, nwf.org, and it's the Garden for Wildlife. They'll they'll give you a lot of resources on what to plant and when to plant it and everything else for, for if you want to try to attract wildlife to your backyard. And if you have any questions on any of this stuff, you can uh, always send me an email. As Bill Webb and Sharon and other people who are in here tonight will attest, I always answer emails. Sometimes it may take me a day or two because uh, – when I'm in Botswana, I'm going to be seven hours difference from you guys and or seven hours difference from the one in central time zone. And we really only have Internet when we get back to camp. And that's if the uh, Internet gods are playing uh, well with the camps that we'll be in. So I'll be able to communicate. But uh, if, you, if you have any questions, send me an email. Always happy to answer questions about this or or anything else I've got going on or any photography related question, or if you just want to send pictures for me to look at, always happy to answer. That's just all part of us uh, sharing what we love together. And I'm always glad to help. So if we don't have any further questions going once, going twice, I will sign off for the night. Cause look at that. It's almost seven fifty-eight, and my timing is always impeccable. I always promise these things to be an hour and we're almost an hour into this thing. So, uh, 
Thank you. Uh, everybody showing up tonight. Be on the lookout probably later on tonight. I will send you the uh, – I'll go ahead and send that video link again if it did – was kind of choppy on your end uh, of the blind stuff so you can pause it and look at how the blind looks. I'll send you a link to the kind of blind I use. Uh, last time I looked, they're about 50 or 60 bucks. And then I will uh, send a link to this video if you want to review it and and – and uh, it may spur on some more questions. But anyway, with that said, I appreciate everything. And uh, thanks, everybody. And look forward to seeing you guys again. Take care.